Acts chapter 14, verse 19. If you have it, say yeah. If you're still waiting for, I don't know what you're waiting for, but it's up on the screen. Let's go. It says this, then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, just for um, biblical accuracy, it's important to highlight that he was stoned but he didn't stone himself. It's not like he got high and that's why he was stoned. These, um, you know, sometimes there's confusion in the original Hebrew. What do we mean by stoned? We're talking about real rocks, not narcotics. <laughs> Supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, ah, it's so hard not to preach this. Who do you have gathered around you? Because your circle could be a matter of life or death. If not your physical life, it could be a matter of life or death for your purpose. So when the disciple gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Father God, we're grateful. We're thankful. We're excited to have this opportunity, God, to give you our worship. But God, our worship is not just a song. Our worship is not just hands lifted. Our worship is what Romans 12 says, where it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to lay down your life as a living sacrifice. This, God, is a reasonable act of worship. So God, we don't give you instruments, songs, or lifted hands. God, we give you our lives and say, do in us and through us as you please. We'll be ever so careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Question, have you ever been winning? I mean like winning, 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 winning. Like you got a raise at work, but it wasn't a 3% cost of living raise. It was a 15%. You're killing it at your job and we won't, don't want to lose you type of winning. You, you, you ever been winning the type of winning where you've been waiting over 12 months to have a child and it comes back, test results, we're pregnant? Winning? Come on now. You ever had the type of winning where you've been managing your money, paying off your debt, preparing, saving for that down payment, and you put in that offer, and they accept your offer over other offers? I, I, I just show hands. How many people you've been through a scene where you were just winning? You were just, you were just, okay, so the rest of you are losers. Great, but um, <laughs> I ain't raising my hand no matter what he says. That's fine. Be a loser. It's all good. You're welcome here anyway. You ever been in a season when you were winning and then the phone rang? And then that text message came. And then there was that ring on the doorbell. Where all of a sudden that 15% raise at work didn't mean much of anything because you had a loved one who was sick. And it went from a celebration moment instantly to survival mode. You, you, you ever been in that situation where, hey, marriage is going well, kids are going well, this is happening, but then the, there's a major financial hardship or there's a job loss or whatever it may be, and it's as if out of nowhere you just get blindsided. And if I'd be honest enough, sometimes every win can be so interrupted by a loss that you don't even get that excited over the wins anymore. Because it's like, this, this, that's why some of y'all didn't raise your hand. If you would be honest, you're winning, but, but, but you feel more in touch with the last loss than you do with the current win. And it's just like, I'm, I'm not even in the emotional state. I'm, I'm done with the roller coasters. I can't do the ups and the downs and the ups and the downs. And so I'm not going to go up. I'm not going to go down. I'm just going to, just going to be there. In Acts chapter 14, we find Paul down, like knocked down, beat down. He got hit in the head with the stone. He was down, down. And you would think that this was possibly the worst day of Paul's life without reading the context of the scripture. 
If you go back to Acts chapter 13, though, you'll find that Paul had one of the, probably the most significant encounter he had ever had in his life. It was in Acts 13 that Paul was ordained into the ministry. His ordination had just happened one chapter prior and watched, I'm again choked. God made his haters ordain him. It's not even like they were planning on ordaining him. They were like, ah, we don't mess with Paul. We know his past. We know that he used to kill Christians and all of that. And God says, no, I've anointed him. I've called him. My hand is on him. And by the way, when God's hand is on you, it doesn't matter whose mouth is against you. Because the hand of God on your life will supersede what anybody has to say. It says that they were here in this prayer meeting and the Holy Spirit spoke to the elders and they said, set us all par and Paul and Barnabas for the work of the ministry, lay hands on them and release them into ministry. And y'all, what a ministry it was. Paul and Barnabas, they're preaching the gospel and literally the dead are being raised. Blind eyes are opening. People are jumping out of wheelchair. Hundreds and thousands of people who were pagan worshipers are accepting Jesus as their Lord. Matter of fact, on this particular day, Paul found himself where he had prayed over a man who was crippled and the man was instantly healed. Now, he wasn't in a Jewish city. He wasn't in a city where people knew about God, whether it was Yahweh or Jesus Christ. They were pagan worshipers. And when they saw this, they said, there's no way a human could perform a miracle like this. Paul and Barnabas must be gods. And the entire city started to celebrate Paul and Barnabas as if they were gods. Matter of fact, they said, Barnabas, he must be Zeus. And, and Paul, he must be Hermes. And, and they began to celebrate them as if they were gods. Be careful the people who celebrate you quickly. There's nothing wrong with being celebrated. It's better than being stoned. But sometimes the same people who celebrate you when you're for them, are the people that are going to pick up the stones when, they do, when you do things that they don't approve of. So here they are screaming and shouting and celebrating for Paul and, and Barnabas. And the Bible says that, that, that Jews from the last city that Paul had come from, they came and began to stir up the city. There are certain people who just cannot keep up with the progress of your life. There are certain people that they will always keep you in the place where they met you. And because this is how I knew you when I first met you, I can never see you past the place where I first. We met in elementary school. I was picking my nose and thought kicking people in their shins was a good idea. I've kind of grown up since then. You've been around people that say, oh, you've changed. As if it was a bad thing. Yes, I have changed. I've grown. I've become more like Christ. I'm more mature. I'm more godly. I have a greater vision. I'm so glad that I changed because if I was to be honest, I didn't even like me back then. I don't know why you liked me. I couldn't stand that guy. And because they can't keep up with the progress of your life, they will only see you and deal with you as who you used to be. They come into the city and they say, Paul, he, 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 he's a murderer and he used to be on the right path. Now he's preaching this Jesus. And in one second, they turned an entire city that was celebrating them as God into a homicidal mob. They picked up stones and they stoned Paul to the point where they thought he was dead. And they dragged him outside of the city. Here was Paul days in to living his purpose in his place of purpose with the anointing of God on his life. And in one second, the enemy dragged him outside of his purpose. We've talked over the last few weeks that God has greatness for you. The whole vision of Union Church is uniting people with purpose. God has miracles for your marriage, for your relationship, for your kids, for your money, for your health, for your career, for your faith. Every area of your life, God wants to do something supernatural. You will wake up one day and you will find yourself in your place of purpose. But you have to understand there is no such thing as purpose without pain. There's no such thing as progress without persecution. 
There is no such thing as success without suffering. And here's the problem. Because we are on a God journey and a God path, and this is what God's called us to, we feel like it's going to be easy like Sunday morning. (laughs) By the way, that is the dumbest song on planet Earth. And whoever wrote it must not have been a senior pastor. Actually, they weren't. Because every other day is easy for me except for Sunday morning. Sunday morning is the most pressure-filled, hard-working day. Sorry, forgive me. It's, my counselor said don't let that out on platform anyway. <laughs> we think because we're walking in what God has for us that pain won't come. It says that Paul was dragged outside of the city, left for dead. And I love this part. It says the disciples gathered around him. And as they gathered around him, he was revived and brought back to life. If when you gather with your people, I don't know who your people are, but if you gather with your people and when you leave, you don't feel more life, you feel drained. You've got the wrong people. You've got to get people around you that just being in their presence revives you and gives you vision and gives you hope and puts faith on the inside of you and puts purpose on you. Somebody say, I got to get around the right people. This ain't my message, but I'm just having fun because I just set you up. But are you the right person? What do people say after they leave your presence? It's so, you know, it's so fun to talk about how jacked up your crew is. Not realizing you in that crew. And some of us are so critical. We're so negative. We're so glass half empty. We're so there's 10 things that are going to happen bad to you. And that's why your vision ain't going to come to pass. That we realize that we're the people with the stones in our hand. No, no, no. You, you, you need to be a person and get around people that breathe life in instead of suck life that's why it's so important to be a part of a life-giving church because life will throw stones at you can can I just talk to you for a second and tell you something that you already know life will put you in a position where you don't have the energy to pray prayer is vital but there will be seasons when your heart is so broken that you can't even form the words Life will put you in a position where you're so overwhelmed, you don't know what verse to turn to. And when David said, encourage yourself in the Lord, it might as well be in a different language because it's so far out of reach. And in that season, if you don't have a community of believers that you can crawl into on a Sunday morning, sit down and say, don't judge me because I'm sitting down during worship. I don't have the joy or the energy to get. That's why I don't get mad at people when they sit down during worship. Because it's a sign to me that life is so heavy on your shoulders, you can't stand up. That's what I'm here for. You sit there. I'm a praise and I'm going to worship for us both. And what God does in me, it's going to get How many people, you have enough faith that you don't just need it for you? I got enough faith for me and my entire row. You just sit there, watch me praise God. And the peace that's on me will get on The most confusing part of this passage says that Paul's connect group gathers around him. He comes back to life. He gets up and he goes right back into the city that just killed him. Could you imagine what the conversation with his friends was like? Paul, we've got a Horse, it is pointed to Jerusalem. We can get you out of town now. What are you doing? That is my place of purpose. Paul. Okay. Paul, promise us not to write this in the Bible because it's going to make us look bad. But we didn't come out here to raise you to, the, to life. We came out here to bury you. God just happened to bring you back to life as we were digging. I didn't even know it was going to happen. What's the point? I don't know if it's going to happen again. If they kill you a second time, you might be dead, dead. I don't know if I've ever seen God raise somebody from the dead, dead. Paul said, I must go to my place of purpose. So much fun shade in scripture. 
Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas, let me say Barnabas. Barnabas. Barnabas got anointed and ordained the same time Paul did. They're going out together, doing ministry together. Zeus, Hermes, when the stones start flying, where Barnabas at? (laughs) Questions that need answers. The next day, Paul goes to Derby. There's Barnabas out of nowhere. And we wonder why later on in Acts, Paul and Barnabas had a falling out and they had a church split. Why? Where were you when the rocks were flying, huh? Can't trust you. Can we have, I I would be doing you a disservice if I preached purpose, greatness, gifting on the inside of you, vision, foundation, a team around you, and didn't preach resilience. Because you can be gifted, anointed, have the right team, have an amazing vision, but if you don't know how to take a hit, and right, walk right back into the place that caused that hit. You'll never maximize what God has for you. You've got to learn how to push through the pain to the purpose that God has for you on the other side. I'm going to give you three quick thoughts. Three quick thoughts. First thing is this. The first step to pushing through pain, the first step to pushing through pain is identifying the source of your pain identify the source of your pain. It's amazing how when we're healed, whether physically, emotionally, spiritually, or whatever it may be, about 12, 14, 18 months after the healing, we forget the pain that we were in. I I actually forgot when I was finishing up the transcript of this book, this time last year, right now, I had a broken thumb. If you go back and watch messages, this time last year, I was looking like Nemo, had a little cast on us, trying to hide my cast while I was preaching, had to hold the mic in my other hand. How'd you break your thumb, Pastor? It's a long story, okay? But what happened was I was out of town in Birmingham, and I got in a fist fight with a Nissan Armada. I lost. Man versus 6,000. I, you know me. All my bad stories happen on golf course. I finish a round of golf. Worst golf of my life, but that's every day of my life. And I throw my golf clubs in the back seat. And I, and I, my reaction time. It, it was why I was hitting every ball wrong. My timing was off. And it just followed me into closing the car door. Have you ever been in so much pain you couldn't cuss? Like, if you're able to cuss, the pain's not that bad. It's not that bad. I didn't cuss. I didn't cry. I didn't scream. I just went and sat down on the curb in complete shock. As I I don't mean to be gross, but I actually do. As I look at my fingernail that is no longer attached to my thumb. And I got, you, you. I'm a dude. I got to give it all to you. So it's like blood under the skin. It didn't even cut this skin, so all the blood is trapped under the nail, and I'm just looking at this plum on my hand. It was so bad. People that were playing golf with, they would see me sitting on the curb. You all right? I'm good. No clue. I mean, throbbing. Ran to the gas station, got me a can of soda, and I was like, man, I'm going to hold the can of soda, and the cold from the soda will... I'm a dude, all right? We ain't that bright when bad things happen. I'm just... <laughs> Went to my meeting that evening. I had no idea what they were talking about in that meeting. It's just heard nothing. <laughs> Somebody said, do you want us to get you a new can of Coke? Like, we could get Sprite, whatever it may be. It's... No, I'm good. And me, y'all, I've never been to the ER in my life. By God's grace, I've been covered and healed and all that kind of stuff. I went, home. I went to the hotel that night. Went to bed. Man, eh, it'll be all right. It hurts, but it'll be good in the morning. I woke up at 2 a.m., room spinning. Woo! Look at the new birdies. I mean, so much pain, I was nauseous. And I'm like, okay, I think something's wrong. I think something's wrong. Maybe, maybe I should go to the ER, okay? I think. So I jump in the car, drive downtown Birmingham, go to the ER. And y'all, I don't watch horror movies, but if I did... It would be the ER in Birmingham. I mean, people walking through there. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, what in the world? And two places you don't want to go without an appointment. The ER and a barbershop. Both places you will sit there and nobody will speak to you. 
Clearly, you know why you're here. So I'm so there 15 minutes. I go up to the desk, sign in, and go up. After 45 minutes, I think it was an angel. Some nurse came up to me. She said, sir, why are you here? You look normal. <laughs> and I said, well, I slammed my finger in a car door. I can't. The room's spinning. I think it's broken. She said, listen, okay, we have a six-hour wait. Everybody around you, they're dying, okay? I... <laughs> She said, if you're able to drive, there's a hospital 30 minutes outside of town. They've got six open beds. They can see you immediately. I'm like, I don't know if I can drive. If I get pulled over, it'll be DUI, and I haven't been drinking, but let's go see what happens. I jump in the car, drive outside of town, go in. In 10 minutes, I'm sitting in the hospital room, and I'm like, y'all have got to give me something from this pain. And they said, we will as soon as we do an x-ray, because before we can treat you, We've got to diagnose you. Before we can heal you, we've got to figure out what's broken. Y'all ready for point number one? Not all pain's the same. Just because you're in pain doesn't mean your pain has the same source. Doesn't mean your pain has the same cause. And watch this. If you don't know the source of your pain, You will administer the wrong treatment. You'll think, let me just sleep it off. And you'll sleep it off. It's broke. Can I give you four types of pain? Here's one type of pain. Pain from a wound. So some of the pain that we experience is because there's parts of our lives that God has not yet healed. There's parts of our lives that are still open wounds from past traumas, past hurts, past pains that we've experienced. Well, I feel fine. Well, why didn't I know that I still needed more healing? Here's why. Because at the level of influence that you used to be at, it didn't put pressure on that area of pain. But now that you have three kids instead of one, now you have five employees instead of being an employee, now that you're in your grad program instead of high school, the new pressure has exposed unhealed parts of your life. There's a healing that God still needs to do in you. Some of the pain we experience is, ugh, oh. So it's not your boyfriend's fault. Huh? Can we talk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got issues. But no, no, there's some stuff with your dad that hasn't been healed yet. And here we'll poke poke that wound. But what's poking the wound is not the cause of the wound. And we'll look at when it's, come on now. Some is wounds I'm here. Some pain is what they call growing pain. Anybody in here, you got a 9-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 13-year-old? My knees hurt. My, my neck hurt. My elbow hurt. You sound. <laughs> I've got an 18-month-old who's teething. And she gets like one new tooth a month. God, why? Why can't they just all come? And we do with the little exorcism that goes on when she's teething. And then move. when she's not teething, she's an angel. When she is... I know there's an age limit for Freedom Conference, but y'all got to take Jade because I can't deal with that child. (laughs) Why? It's it's, it's a good thing to get teeth. It's a good thing to grow taller, but it hurts. There's a pain that's a good pain because it means you're not where you used to be. Oh, oh, man. Come on, married folks. You ever ever disagreed about the budget? I mean, got mad, mad. You know why you got mad? Because you had an amazing spouse to discuss the budget with. Huh? Because maybe we got more responsibilities than we've ever had. And this pain is being created by the progress of our life. Come on, employers, you ever had to let somebody go? It's painful. But thank God you have somebody to let go. Some pain is people pain. Um, people be crazy. And I know it's bad grammar, but it's good preaching. Because here's, here's what happens. There's wounds that we all experience through life. And then there's the growing pains. 
But if I don't heal from the wounds of life and I don't adapt to the growth of life, I will inevitably hurt other people. Come on now. And there are just people that refuse to heal from the wounds of their life. There's just people that refuse to grow into the maturity that they need to be walking in. And as a result, they don't understand your boundaries. And they cause pain in your life. The last type of pain is spiritual warfare. Where the enemy will attack what he is intimidated by. He's intimidated by your marriage. He's intimidated by your friendship. He's intimidated by the finances that you're building that he knows you're going to use to bring a blessing to other people. He's intimidated by your faith and your confidence, and he will always attack what he's intimidated by. So watch this. You're upset at the person not knowing it's not just the person, it's the enemy behind the person. Ephesians 6.12 says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. When's the evil day? Well, I studied the the Proverbs and I studied Revelations and Isaiah and I looked at all the prophets and I found out that the evil day is today (laughs) and tomorrow and yesterday. Is now. After you've done all you can, stand. Just because you're in pain doesn't mean it's the same. Some of it can be something that needs to be healed, or I'm growing through something, or a person that's crossing boundaries. Or you know what it normally really is? It normally really is that there's a wound inside of me that is making this new growth painful. But it's that individual who's identifying the pain in my life, but that individual is being used by the enemy. It's usually not one or the other. It's usually all of the... Second thing, write this down, write this down, write this down. Don't stop. Go through it. You, you, you know, it's, I don't know if you were a part of the church last year, but slam the car door and broken thumb, x-ray, Saw the fracture of my thumb. They said, hey, here's some painkillers. Here's a cast. Go back home. See your your doctor there and figure out they need to do surgery or if they'll just be able to heal normally or whatever it may be. About two weeks later, I go into the doctor here in Maryland. They take a second x-ray. And the doctor says, where was the fracture again? And I'm like, it's right there on the inside of my thumb. And he said, who said they saw it? I said, well, I have an x-ray right here if you see it right there. And he said, there's no fracture in your thumb. I, I, I've got an x-ray that shows a fractured thumb. I've got an x-ray that shows a healed thumb in less than 10 days. How many people know God's a healer? Now, if you're not used to me, I love God, but I'm a little critical of God, so don't judge me. Here's my beef. You healed my thumb. Why couldn't you put my fingernail back? Questions that need answers. He's almighty. You're in the miracle business. It's like when Amazon Prime drops one package only to come back six hours later with the second package. It was in the car. Could have dropped both at the same time. I'm just... So I had a miracle healing and a fingernail that took nine months to grow back. Every morning, waking up to my kids throwing rocks at me. Daddy, your thumb is ugly. I wanted to be like, your, never mind. (laughs) Some pain you have to go through. This is a tight one, ain't it? This is not a lot of laughing moments. And what I find over and over and over and over again It's people running from discomfort and running from pain. And anything that's uncomfortable, I am going the opposite direction. Hear me. Everything worth having is on the other side of this pain. And everything that you don't want to have is running in the opposite direction. Psalm 23, 4 says this, Yea, though I walk around, 
under, over. God, deliver me. God, save me. God, make it go away. No, you're going to go through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. We got to break down scripture sometimes. You ain't going, look at your neighbor and say, you ain't going to die. You ain't going to die. Come on, come on, come on. Look at it. Look, you ain't, ain't going to die. You ain't going to die. But you're going to feel like you're dying. I'm just saying. <laughs> Isn't that what it said? It's not death. It's just a shadow of death. You ain't dying. It feels like it. It, it absolutely feels like it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For my God, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You may have come today for this one point. Don't you dare turn around. Don't quit. And for the love of God, please don't park and have a pity party. Go through. Pastor, I can't take much more. Yes, you can go through. I don't know if I can wake up one more morning. Yes, you can go through, go through, go. How do, sometimes it is minute by minute. I'm going to put one more foot forward. One more. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just keep going forward. Pastor, that sounds insensitive. You don't know the pain that I've been through. You don't know this is not my first battle. This is not my first setback. This is not my first diagnosis. I don't know if I have what it takes to keep going through. I know you have what it takes. Why? Because you're not going through by yourself. He said, I will fear no evil for my God. God is with me. You've got to understand every step that you take, your God is right in step with you. Pastor, I'm too exhausted to walk. That's okay because God will carry you through it. Whatever you do, don't stop. Says thy rod and thy staff, they bring me comfort. A shepherd's rod was his journal. What he would do is he would etch an emblem on that staff of encounters that he had prior with God to remind him of what God had done. So when David went after Goliath, David was a shepherd. So David would have had a staff. And here's all the soldiers terrified about this giant. David grabs his staff and he said, look at that. That's Simba. Simba tried to steal one of my sheep. And I went after Simba and I killed Simba because God delivered me from the lion. And look at this right here. This is a bear, Yogi Bear. Yogi Bear tried to steal one of my sheep. And the power of God came on me and I killed that bear with my bare hands. The same God who did delivered me from the lion and delivered me from the bear will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine. Bring it on. How do I go through pain? Remember the last pain that God brought you through, how he did not leave you, how he did not abandon you. He strengthened you. He carried you. And then he rewarded you on the other side and made the enemy pay you back double for your trouble. The same God who brought you through is the same God who will do it again. I know I'm young, but I've been through some stuff. When you see your parents battle cancer three times, not once. When you see siblings go through three brain surgeries, not once. When you bury parents long before it's their time to be buried. And every time you see the grace of God pick you up and carry you further. And every time you see the sustaining hand of God carry you through stuff that other people literally lost their mind in. All of a sudden you realize it's a shadow of death, but I will fear no evil for my God is with me. Why am I'm preaching the message upside down? Why am I going through this pain? Hear me, because the enemy only attacks what he's afraid of. And the level of your pain is an indication of the size of your purpose. Who gave you that purpose? God did. God did. Make that a song. So if God gave you that size purpose, it must be because he knew he could trust you with that pain. Go through it. It'll be worth it. Okay. 
done preaching. Y'all ready to get professor-like? Okay, how do I go through pain? First pain, the wounds on the inside of me. How, how do I deal with the wounds that life has caused? By the way, for all of us, there's only two people in the world. People who know that life has wounded them and people who are living in denial. But you don't get through life unscathed. And here's the annoying thing about God. He will not heal you all at once. The Bible says, Exodus chapter 23, verse 29, I will not drive them out from before you in one year. Watch this. Lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field become too numerous for you. If I had time to unpack biblical imagery, every time you see beast or birds of the air, it's talking about demonic spirits. And he said, if I drive all the giants out of the land at once, there'll be too much land for you to control and to protect, and you'll be overcome by the end. He said, I'm not going to do it in one year. He said, no, no, no. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you can inherit all of the land. God will not heal you of all your trauma in one year. Why? Can we just talk blunt? You can't handle it. Huh? Think, think about this. If someone's in a horrible car wreck and they bring them into the ER and the person's in pretty bad shape, do they do seven surgeries at once? No, the, the body can't handle that level of shock. They said, no, no, we've got to wait till the swelling in the brain comes down. Then we've got to check the heart. Come on, I sound like I know something about medicine, right? I know nothing, but... <laughs> I watch a lot of TV. We, <laughs> we got to check. We got to stop the bleeding. What, they go for the vitals first. Sometimes you heal up and you come back months later for reconstructive surgery. Because they said, we can't do the reconstructive surgery when you're healing up from the actual trauma. We've got to space it out so your body can handle it. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. God doesn't deal with all your issues. In growth track. <laughs> Finish growth track. I'm, I'm a disciple of the Lord now. No, you're not. No, you are not. You are saved. Barely. <laughs> Here's what I've discovered. New influence exposes new wounds. One thing that I battled greatly growing up was insecurity. I just thought I was insignificant, invisible, and all that. And it was a battle. And God has healed me from insecurity to the point where I can stand up and preach in front of you people. I don't, you don't got to say amen at all. I like my preaching. <laughs> I beat insecurity until I wrote this book. When I tell you the way that insecurity came flooding in, who do you think you are? You're not an author. You're a preacher. You can't even read, more or less, write a book. <laughs> so insensitive. Why would you laugh there? <laughs> like all the moments not to laugh. That's where you laugh. Golly, y'all need freedom conference. Anyway, <laughs> no, I'm talking about nobody's going to read this book. It's not going to make sense. They're going to think I'm doing it just for me. Blah, and just, and I'm like, I, I was caught up. Where did all of this self-doubt come from? I beat this. No, you beat this at the level of pressure you used to be at. But the new level of pressure expects, exposes a new need for healing. So this wasn't in my message, but let's just throw it here. So always have compassion for wounded people. Because you're not as whole as you think. You just haven't hit the right level of pressure. Yeah. What do I do with the wounds inside of me? This, write this down. It's only one thing you do. Don't hide them. Don't hide them. How did Paul heal in community? It was the disciples that gathered around him that brought life to the dead parts of his. There's only believers gathered around you that will bring life to the dead parts of you. So get in a connect group. And by the way, don't give them all your dirt the first week. They'll freak out. They'll be like, oh, you jacked up. No, don't do that. <laughs> first week, I'm, I'm messing connect groups up. Don't do it this way, but this is how I would do connect groups. I'm going to go. I'm going to listen. I'm going to let y'all tell y'all dirt. Oh, you jacked up. Oh, man. You are crazy. Okay. No, you cannot have my number. I will not be talking to you after these 10 weeks. All right. 
Then after about three weeks, when I've discovered I'm an introvert, this is how we operate. This is a safe place. Everybody here crazy? <laughs> then I'd be like, hey, a little bit of my crazy. <laughs> I'm doing all right? Okay, here's a little bit. All right, this is who I am. I'm a, I'm a little messed up. But when I hide my crazy, are y'all offended by me saying that? I got a little bit of crazy too. My wife will tell you all about it, but I don't let her. Um, When I hide my crazy, the enemy gets to beat me up with it. But when there's people of faith who love me and they have my back and they know my wounds, healing comes. Don't hide it. Expose it in a connect group. Expose it to a therapist. Oh, can we have fun? Can we have real fun? I am not your therapist. I'm your pastor. I preach from God's word. I do not have a PhD in how your brain, heart, and trauma works. You need a believer who is educated on matters of the heart and the men. You need a believer who is educated, not your barber. Boy, we be working out heart issues at the barbershop. Man, let me take my take my take my edge back there. But let me tell you about this woman, man. She tripping. No. no, no, no. You need a Christian therapist that can walk you to a place, and you need Freedom Conference. What's Freedom Conference? It is coming up at the end of November, and it is two days where you allow the Spirit of God to heal parts of you that you've pushed to the back of your memory, but yet it's still affecting your future. All right, I really gotta speed up. How do I deal with growing pains? Pick one area where you need to grow and focus on that area. You ready? For six months. Yeah, you ever, you ever looked at your life and realized, I'm really jacked up? I'm disorganized. I don't know how to talk to people. I'm always late for this, this, this. And it can be so overwhelming. Where do I start? You can't fix seven things. I'm, I'm so angry that I'm such a horrible golfer that I'm, like, I'm paying for lessons now. And I go to golf lessons yesterday, and, and the coach says, okay, here's what I want you to do. I need you to swing back two feet and forward two feet. I said, the ball's not going to go anywhere. He said, it wasn't going anywhere anyway, okay? So just... <laughs> <laughs> you don't really enjoy it. <laughs> so I'm there doing it. He said, what are you working on? Are you working on your path, or are you working on your stance? I said, both. He said, stop it. He said, you can't fix two things at once. You will end up fixing nothing. He said, just pick stance or path. I said, path. I was still working on my stance, though. (laughs) He said, when you've mastered that one thing, then going on to the next. What's the one area where I need to grow in? I'm going to give six months to that, and then I'll go to the next thing. And guess what? 12 months from now, you're two times better than you are right now. And 24 months from now, you're four times better than you are right now. Pastor, but there's eight things I have to work on, but we've been focusing on the last eight for the last eight years and have made minimal progress in all of them. What do I do with people pain? You build a big fence. Okay, no, that's not that. That's, that's the introvert. That's to hurt me. That's to hurt me. Guys, guys, here. Okay, here, quickly, quickly. What I do with people pain, three things. First thing you do with people pain is you respond with compassion. It's not fair what they're saying about me, lying about me, doing to me, blah, 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 blah. Yes, but hear me, with the love and grace of God, you have done that to other people. I would never, you have. Here's how I know. Because there was a wounded season of your life. And in that, even if it was just cutting off good people, in the wounded season of your life, not intentionally, but you wounded some other people. And you've got to understand that person that is wounding you, I don't care if it's an ex, an in-law, an outlaw, a friend, doesn't matter. They're not doing it intentionally. It's out of their wound. It does not mean it's okay. But I can show you compassion because I've been there before. Step two of people pain. Figure out what wound in you needs to be healed. Watch this. An offense is a decision. You're not offended by what they said. You're offended because you chose to be offended. Hmm? Because other people could say whatever they want to say and water off the back. 
It's because there's something in me that God still needs to heal. And he used that person to expose it. So actually, you need to thank your haters. Because they're showing you where you need to grow, maybe in humility. Maybe in your confidence. Step number three of people praying is build high fences. No, I was serious. Build a high fence. Get a restraining order. Stop picking up their phone call. Change their name in your phone to don't you pick up. Ever. Last name, ever, ever, ever. Here's what the Bible says. Guard your above. We think it says guard our money. Because we watch our money in a way we don't watch our heart. God says stop letting people close who do not know how to protect your most valuable asset. You ever had someone with their little bad kids come to your house? <laughs> not your kids, other people's kids. And they just taking their toys and banging it on your coffee table. And you, but you know how much that coffee table costs more than your life? What are you doing? <laughs> There's just some people that they are not... They're not careful enough to be allowed to hold your heart. So stop giving it up. Tracking with me? How do I deal with spiritual warfare? This is like a professor class. Boom, 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 boom. You ready for spiritual warfare? As you read scripture, there are two responses to spiritual warfare. One is to ignore it. One is to engage it. Are we preaching now? Every time the enemy attacks does not mean you need to go into a time of prayer and fasting. Every time the enemy attacks doesn't mean you need to start Jericho marching around your house screaming in tongues. How do I know when to get the canola oil? Start anointing my doorposts. Here's how you know. Is this attack blocking me from what God has for me? Or is it some peripheral issue that does not have the authority to keep me from where I need to go? So for example, I have a coworker who hates me. They're mean and they're talking trash or whatever. Do they determine your raise? Do they determine your bonus? They, do they determine how you perform at work? Then do not engage. Now, if they step in your space, then... Oh, them hands, but to... <laughs> I'm from Baltimore. All right, guys, I'm not all saved. Still a little wounded. God's still working on me. <laughs> because watch this. Some attacks of the enemy. The only goal is distraction. The only goal of that person through the enemy is to get your eyes off of what you're really supposed to be working on and fighting for and giving your energy to. And watch this. Yes, you put them in your place. Yes, you had your say. But watch this. The energy that it took to deal with that situation, you are now depleted on the energy that you needed to fulfill the purpose that God has for you. Stop fighting battles that are not blocking your purpose. Now, if it's blocking your purpose, God help them. You call every single person in your connect group. We're praying, we're fasting, we're beseeching, we're crying out to God. That's where you bring out the oil. That's where you decree what God says. That's where you scream in tongues until you see it break in the spiritual realm. And when you're done, pick up your phone and call your attorney. Because we don't just fight in the spiritual but we're going to use every avenue that God has given us to move the purpose that he has for us forward. Where's Sean at? Man, you see, I'd, I'd been done if he had started playing, but it's not my fault. <laughs> you know you can't win, right? It does not matter what you do. You can't win. All right, write this down. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, somebody shout joy. Come on, flowers, shout joy at me. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The most gangster moment in scripture is not when Paul was stoned to death, came back to life, and walked right back into the city. 
The most gangster moment in scripture is when Jesus looked at the cross and he said, bring it on. You can't miss what he said. He said, they did not take my life. I gave it. Jesus hanging on the cross. If he had sneezed wrong, the whole world would have died. Everybody did. Let's start over. Did it once. Work with Noah. Let's do it again. No, 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 no. He didn't succumb to the cross. He decided to go through the cross. And if I had time to preach, I'd tell you how he, wouldn't ha he didn't have to. Because Satan brought him up on a high mountain and said, I'll give you the whole world if you will bow down and worship me. Every time you face pain, Satan will always give you a shortcut. He'll always give you a way out of the pain. But here's what Jesus said. He looked at the cross. Then Hebrews 12, 2 said he looked around the cross and he saw Stephen Chandler. And he saw that if he did not go through the cross, that Stephen would burn in a lake of fire. He said, nope, nope, I'm going through the cross. And he looked around the cross and he saw broken humanity healed, delivered, set free and spiritual sons and daughters. And he said, their freedom is worth this pain. The only way you will endure pain is if you have a vision of what God has for you on the other side. No, no, it's worth it fighting for this marriage because of what God has on the other side. It's worth it fighting through this debt because of what God has on. My greatest purpose and fulfillment is on the other side of this pain. So I'm gonna pray the prayer Jesus prayed. If there's any way I can get out of this, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will. Why, why would I go through that pain? Because you've got to believe that your greatest joy is not in turning back. Your greatest joy is on the other side of that. I need to end this message. What happened if I had lost my mom when my mom passed away? What would have happened if I said, well, if God didn't heal her, I'm not working for him anymore. It would never be this moment. The, the joy me sneaking in a woman's night, sitting in the back of the room, seeing women go crazy, talk about stuff. I'm like, ah, I don't want to hear this. Would have never happened if I didn't push past the last pain. And it's painful now. But imagine what God has on the other side of it. Father God, we're grateful. We're thankful. That yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God, we are not by ours. Somebody needs to hear this. You feel more alone than you've ever felt in your life, but you are not by yourself. Your God is with you. And he has a flawless record of saving and delivering. Right where you're sitting with your eyes closed and your head bowed, if you could pray this prayer with me, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Just give God a moment to make this time, to make this message personal to you. I want to pray particularly for those of you that would be honest enough to say, Pastor, I am going through this pain by myself. God's not with me because I wouldn't let him. Maybe you're like me and you grew up in church and you believe in God, but you know he's not at the center of your life. Or maybe you're new to this church thing. Or Let's be real. Maybe you're playing this church thing here because my friends are here because my mama wants me to be here or whatever. But if you'd be honest, you would say, no, Christ is not the center of my life. I'll boldly say you'll never make it through the adversity of life without him. Oh, there's such a great purpose for you on the other side. Wherever you find yourself, you say, pastor, that's me. I, I know that Christ is not in the right place in my life, but I, I need to make that adjustment. I need to make that shift. Wherever you find yourself, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, Thank you for enduring the pain and the shame of the cross for me, for my sin, for my forgiveness. Today, I surrender. I give you all of me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.